Anthologies are hard to market because it's difficult to um, explain to people what what it's all about. Welcome again to MakingComics.com, the podcast about making comics. Today, I have killer guests. 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 <laughs> if I can say that right. We have Kazu Kiryushi. The creator and artist and writer behind Amulet series by Scholastic Books. Now, just so you know, I mean, we'll talk about this in the interview, but this series has sold over a million copies already, and um, it's just, it's, yeah, it, I mean, it's just, that's amazing. So, um, in addition to that, Kazoo uh, launched a Kickstarter about uh, over a month ago, and it's closed now, and it has received over $50,000 in pledges for uh, his book called Daisy Cutter, which which is an older book uh, that he printed a long time ago, couldn't find a publisher for it, and so he just decided to reprint it through Kickstarter by launching a Kickstarter, and blammo! Uh, now he's uh, self-publishing it. So that is another exciting thing that we're going to talk about. And if that isn't enough, Kazu is also the man responsible f- behind the Flight Anthology series that was first published by Image, blew up, and then was picked up by Random House. And uh, since then, they have had eight volumes and have branched out into other anthologies as well. So anyway... Um, Kazu is crazy and awesome, and we'll talk to him. And we also have another special guest who just happens to be Kazu's right hand man. His name is Jason uh, Kafo. I believe I pronounced it right. Jason, I apologize if I didn't. Uh, Jason Kafo is uh, is is um, I don't know what his technical name is, but he helps. Kazoo with uh, his his amulet books, and uh, he colors and heads up the coloring now, and just blows your mind if you see uh, the kind of paintings he does from scratch. Um, most of the backgrounds in the books are are Jason's handiwork now uh, for the later books, anyway. So anyway, because I was just planning on meeting with Kazoo and Jason, I figured I would try to just head on over to their studio and uh, record it all there. So so I brought a little recorder over. We sat down one night, ended up talking for about two, a little over two hours, and then they gave me a tour of the studio for another hour and showed me the whole process. And uh, it was just a very inspiring night. And um, we were up till like one in the morning. But anyway, here it is. This is... Uh, the pretty much unedited uh, conversation we had once we hit the record button. Um, I hope you guys enjoy it. With flight, when we started, it was easy because people thought of it as, um, as uh, either a book that was themed, you know, like a a flight themed book, or I think most people interpret it, hopefully as like flights of fancy and, you know, fantasy. Mm -hmm. And that first book was in some ways um, a statement book. And so it made sense when we did the first flight. It was like saying, hey, look, there's other comics. There's all sorts of different types of comics out there that, um, that we can create. And, uh, and I think that book um, kind of introduced that. But mm-hmm. when we continued to do it, it was just difficult for people to understand why we're, <laughs> you know, what, what it was. Mm-hmm. You know, it's hard to describe to somebody why they would buy volume three as opposed to volume four. Oh, you know, it, it would require a lot of um, explanation, and they're very expensive books. You know, and this is one of the reasons why we moved on to Explorer. Um, and we have uh, Explorer the Mystery Boxes, where every story in this particular volume is uh, <coughs> revolves around the theme of, or the idea of a mystery box. There's a central conceit that each of the stories revolves around, and they, every storyteller takes on that challenge. It's easy to explain to somebody what that volume is about, mm. as opposed to the next volume, if it's uh, whatever that next volume is going to be about, you know, and we okay. have ideas what we're gonna, where we already have some yeah. ideas, but so it makes it easy ideas. for readers to interface with it, and it makes it easy for booksellers and librarians to recommend it because mm-hmm. they can they can tell somebody what it's about, and it's very difficult for somebody, even for us, you know, as the, like artists in flight, 
it's really difficult for us to tell somebody what the book is about. Um, and so with Explorer, it, it was kind of an answer to that issue of, you know, we can say it's seven different stories. Each one is about a mystery box. And hopefully that'll churn some ideas in their head and they'll be interested. Yeah. And, and, and this ties back into our, our <clears throat> mission, uh, in a sense, in that I, I wanted to make comics for people who don't read comics right now. Mm. And so everything that we do moving forward has to be easy to explain mm -hmm. because you have to to explain it to somebody who might not be willing to listen at first we want to to you know perhaps probably we're really reintroducing comics to them mm -hmm. because they haven't read comics of the quality that they're probably seeing in not, not necessarily our books but i mean mm -hmm. if, if we if we do our job correctly then mm -hmm. then we're we're showing them the kinds of comics that they probably fell in love with when they were kids and they hadn't seen since you know and so mm -hmm. Um, in order to do that well, I feel like we have to be able to explain ourselves at every turn. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just one of the reasons why we shifted gears into Explorer. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's a great, would you say, mission statement? The yeah, the mission was like we wanted, yeah, we saw that flight was becoming, in some ways, um, a very niche book. It was mm -hmm. becoming a book that was picked up by a lot of animation talent and, mm -hmm. and students, art students, and anybody who is inspired to make their own stuff. And I think that that audience is a, is a great audience and I love them. They're, they're my friends, you know, mm -hmm. but in order for us to sur survive collectively, we need to make things for other people mm -hmm. besides ourselves. And, yeah. um, and we have to explain, be able to, you know, at, at, at the very least be able to explain what we're trying to do yeah. to somebody, whether it's your mom, your friend's mom, your, yeah. your, 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 your friend, your, your friends that don't read comics, you know, yeah. you know, your kids and, you know, teachers, huh. librarians. And it's interesting that. too, because with the amulet, we're making comics for people who are kids who don't read at all. You know, yeah. they're, they're very reluctant to, um, get into reading and we get a lot of mail from parents just thanking us for, you know, the book that got their kid into reading. And so that's kind of the, the focus we have with that series now is trying to propel kids into, you know, really good literature by giving them an easy entry point. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess what we're basically segueing into is the idea that, um, we're constantly trying to find ways to make our comics a tool for something hmm. for to, that, you know, that you can use to either teach kids to read or to communicate something um, beyond the idea of just making them, you know, or yeah. being an artist, you yeah. know, and, and we want to, to find our place amongst just people in general and, and fit in with the, the social fabric, you know, somewhere. Yeah. And that's really what comics need to do in order to become mainstream. Mm -hmm. Um, but in, in Japan, it makes sense because of the mass transit, you know, well, for one, it was because someone like Osama Tezuka had arrived and, had created he was a he was a doctor who made comics for the people you know mm -hmm. he was a doctor i mean he had a, a degree in medicine and then he switched into he went into comics because that's what he had done, been doing for so much of his life and if you mm -hmm. read his comics they do they they feel like little medicine tablets you know for mm -hmm. the people and that's i think the way they they saw it especially in post-war japan there mm -hmm. was this pessimism of having lost the war and everything these things and you have something like atom or atom uh, or um, um astro boy right yeah. and in, in some ways he's kind of like a, the, their mickey mouse and that he's kind of this um this icon for post-war japan you know and he's he's servicing the country in that way and they they really put him on that pedestal and said he is our man mm -hmm. and then comics became so important to them and so ingrained in their culture Mm -hmm. um, and then it became ubiquitous, you know, and it was everywhere over time. And that's how comics become mainstream. Mm -hmm. So we, we sort of need more people to think about themselves more like doctors or engineers or yeah. the people who build our cultures, you know, yeah. um, in a very serious manner, um, and, and use comics as their tool. Yeah. You know? That's great. So, so when you think about like where Mer America is with comics, like Marvel and DC type mm -hmm. stuff, um, it obviously, it sounds like you're looking at it completely past that, like more right. like not just entertainment, not just making artists happy, but sure, drawing sure. stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't fault Marvel and DC. I don't think yeah. Marvel and DC did anything that's necessarily wrong. They're probably not 
quite as good as they used to be <laughs> at making the comics for the people. Um, a lot of it is probably because they just have a, a need to succeed. Yeah. You know, but also so, I don't, I mean, I don't necessarily think they knew that's what they were doing during right. the golden age. And yeah, probably not, you know, but they were creating, they were creating, um, modern mythologies mm-hmm. and they still are. And I actually do think even today that the folks at Marvel and DC kind of, you know, and to some extent know what they're doing in that mm-hmm. they're trying to maintain the images of their cultural icons, their, their modern myths yeah. and saying, here's, here's the modern myth of Captain America. We need to, this yeah. is the canon. We want like you, the hired artist to follow that and yeah, to, yeah. to put them back up on that pedestal. And, and I think in that way, what they do is actually pretty valid. They're just not doing it as effectively or as universally as they once did, yeah. you know, and, but it's not, you know, I, I don't, I don't think they're doing anything wrong. They're just not doing, doing it as well. That's all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. So, um, I guess before we move on from anthologies, um, it seems like there's a lot of people trying to do them now. Mm-hmm. And, um, so besides having like a, a theme that's easily, easily explained, like a log mm-hmm. line or something, like, is there anything else that you would consider? Like, what if I, as an artist, were to write a bunch of stories and and draw them? All? Well, I guess what Jake Parker did, like, mm-hmm. and, and make an anthology of his own. Yeah, yeah. Books. I mean, Do you think that's a more successful model? Um. I, well, or, the thing is, you know, Jake put those. You know, when we when we put together our short stories in flight mm-hmm. and then collect them. Mm-hmm. You know, we're doing it over the course of, in Jake's case, it's like almost 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you'd have to have something that's massively successful to, to um, feel like you, you know, if you thought about it as an investment, and I don't think Jake did. He was just yeah. really just doing yeah, great stuff. He loved stuff, it. He loved mm-hmm. it, you know? And then there was just a need to have a book together because it, they were getting lost amongst the yeah. volumes of flight. So, yeah. you know, I, I like it when projects come together on a need base. Like on a, a need need to have basis, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I think I think uh, Antler Boy was that, you know, and it, it fit that pro- in that that particular mold. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't know. I mean, following that model would be a very long term yeah. commitment. Um, I I think that's one great way to go about doing things, you know, mm-hmm. just collecting things that you comics just generally are just collected, yeah. you know, uh, collected short comics that are you know that a graphic novel is generally a collection of. Single yeah. issues, you know, yeah. but um, that's that's a perfectly fine way to go. I, I don't know if there is a correct model right now. Yeah. Really, the issue is we haven't, as a culture, defined how we ingest these comics. We haven't decided whether or not we really all want to go to the comic store and get it every Wednesday. Mm-hmm. You know, at one point, I feel like America had decided that the thing to do was to go to the grocery store mm-hmm. and you you buy a comic book for your kid to probably shut him up in the shopping cart mm-hmm. <laughs> and he just like reads his Spider-Man or Superman or Batman. And, you know, he, he reads his thing and then he gets excited and it's, you know what I mean? It was, it, it had a, it had a place, but now because the cost of printing these books and the, uh, you know, it, the cost of trying to get it in some place like a supermarket, there's like all these different factors that basically push comics out of that, that place. So, and plus, people don't really need them as much in those particular spaces now because the kids have yeah. cell phones and all sorts of things. You know, yeah. even even Japan is dealing with that right now. I think mm-hmm. in that um, the comics are becoming less popular because of the proliferation of TV cell phones. Mm-hmm. You know, and being able to watch programs on your your phone in the subway because yeah. they have Wi-Fi in the subway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's very difficult to compete with that. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So tell. So how did you how did you get a deal with Scholastic in the first oh, place to do something like Amulet? Deal. Sorry, because I kept saying Amulet. Because um, that seems like yeah. a hard story to have a log line for, right? <laughs> um, actually, no, it was really easy. It was, the it was. log line was really simple. I actually put together, and you can't really do this now. It was I I came in at a time when manga was like just the hottest thing in the bookstores and the mm-hmm. sa- the sales growth for manga and they they lumped manga in with graphic novels you know okay. so they'll say manga is, is is the same as mouse or bone or whatever yeah. whatever else is out there you know dark knight returns and then they and watchmen and they'll lump them all together and say graphic novels are hot and so a lot of people were 
you know, doing more, like a way more projects on spec than they are now because they haven't been able to replicate the success of manga in uh, American comics, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe with the exception of a few things like Bone. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, so back then I had already done Daisy Cutter. So I had a book under my belt and I had edited three volumes of Flight or I was working mm -hmm. on the third volume and that was already, <clears throat> that was being picked up by Random House. Right. And so um, Scholastic was already looking to work with me at the time, and I happened to have that pitch. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I thought Scholastic would be the right home. And then mm -hmm. we ended up connecting through a friend. Uh, Raina Telgemeier was drawing Babysitter's Club, and she saw my live journal post about it. I was like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this book. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking about pitching it to Scholastic. And then Raina just showed up. It was a friend's lock post. It wasn't public. And she said, this would be perfect for Scholastic. You know, so Raina had a lot to do with bringing it over there. You know, so she said this will be perfect. And Jenna, my editor, Jenna Marshima was her her editor at the time, was, was looking to work with me. Okay. And so she, uh, uh, within I think even just at, within hours, I got an email, and there was basically an offer on the table. Wow. And then I went to um, my friend Scott McLeod. I'm going to drop the name drop there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my uh, friend. Who? You know, who I don't, you I don't know. Name. I'm not my familiar friend, with him. My buddy. <laughs> My buddy Scott. Mm -hmm. Now we we took him to dinner. I was asking. I, I asked him for some advice, you know, because I hadn't worked with a book publisher before, you know, and I had worked on Daisy Cutter. Didn't make any money, mm -hmm. and it was you know it was a small publisher, small comics publisher. So um, I was moving into territory that I wasn't expecting to. I didn't think I was going to actually do comics full time at the time. Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to end up going back in animation. Okay. Um, and that that's basically where my path that's, was at the time. Okay. Because yeah, okay. I didn't think it was possible for me to continue. Yeah. Um, having made no money on Daisy, having gotten no film deal on Daisy, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> having having basically created Flight as like a non profit organization that I didn't really, you know, profit yeah. I didn't, you know, live on that money either. So it was really, really difficult for me to live. And then um, you know, there was a deal on the table for Amulet. In fact it was actually both Scholastic and um Mark Siegel at first second was just mm -hmm putting together for a second. It was before they even mm -hmm. had a name. And he had just had like a, a um, PDF, I think, you know, of like his vision. <laughs> it was really, it was really cute. Actually, it was really great. And he was super enthusiastic. One of the, most, one of the greatest friends of comics, I think, Mark Siegel. And he, he uh, sent me an email and said like, hey, I love Flight and I love you guys. And then he contacted me and Chris Appelhans and Kang Lee. Okay. And he said, well, I'd love to do a book with you guys. And then I said, well, I have this book. And, uh, you know, and then he was like, oh, that looks great, you know. And so there was already people who were interested in the book. And then I yeah. consulted Scott, and then he put me in touch with his agent. And then she put me in touch with a whole bunch of other editors in the book industry and got a whole bunch of interest. And then there was a bidding war for the book. Wow. And so I ended up, uh, and then all of a sudden I was, you know, I guess I, me and Craig Thompson that year had become like the highest paid graphic novelist up to that wow. point. Um, it's still not a lot of money <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at the time because it took me two years to do that first book. So, you know, it was still like, you know, less than my salary that I made, you know, when I was working in animation or as a graphic designer, but, um, but it was something, you know, I was still yeah. able to live and it was fantastic. And at that point I kind of knew that this would be what I'd do for the rest of my life. Oh, cool. Yeah. And I heard that some, I think in an interview with you somewhere saying that the first book sold 250,000 copies? Was that oh, right? Oh, at the time yeah. that uh, we were pitching Daisy? Yeah. It sold probably close to 400,000 now. Really? Yeah. It, that was a while ago that we pitched That's Daisy. That's just insane. Yeah. The I, first I don't book know is, anything mm -hmm. comparative other than Bone, of, co or of course, way over. You know, yeah. Like for, for, the, the, for the series, we're close to a million now. Wow. million books. Yeah, yeah. Which is excellent. Yeah, Scholastic has really interesting distribution. You know, like they have their own special channels, though, too. So mm -hmm. it kind of goes... We fly under the radar in a way, you know, unless you go to a school and you just mention Amulet and Bone, mm -hmm. and then you'll just see like all the kids like go, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and then, and then they ever all the kids know about it. But you know, I feel like you know, because we're not on like books, like a lot of the book scan numbers don't show up, and you know, Diamond, we don't, I mean, Scholastic doesn't really push their books through Diamond, you don't really see, oh, really? Okay. yeah, so you don't see us on like your regular sales figure, you know, huh. channels that, that most people take a look at. Um, Interestingly enough, I think the New York Times takes into account like a lot of Scholastics channels, and that's why we were on the Times bestseller list for 16 weeks. But wow, for Amulet Four. Okay. Yeah. But um, but the books, yeah, have been doing have been doing well, and we're still alive. 
Yeah. <laughs> and how long do you see? Holding on by the skin of our teeth, I'll, I'll tell you that, though. It's not, <laughs> has not been easy. Yeah. You know, it's not like we won the lottery, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've made some sacrifices. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. And Jason's seen how hard it has been for me, you know. I I take loans. I do things like, you know, yeah. just find ways to keep us going, you know. Um, but it's worth it, yeah. you know. And in the long run, it's going to be well worth it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It already Pretty is. Cool. It's already fanta- it's been fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, no regrets. Wow, that's exciting. It, it just seems like it's... Uh, I've talked to so many graphic novelists, and, 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 and everyone's struggling to sell, like, you know, 10,000 10, copies. <laughs> and then I hear this, you know, I'm just like... It's just, it blows my mind. So, I mean, it's... It's, it's all a, the, it's about distribution. It's not... Yeah, even, like, I mean, if it's we the benefit of working books, with a publisher. <laughs> yeah. if, we, if we hand-sold these books, we'd have the same problem. But, you know? yeah. but even other people that work with big publishers, you know, mm-hmm. they're mm-hmm. maybe they're approaching 40,000 or 50 or... Sure, you know? sure, yeah. Um, I mean... Uh, and, and again, I, I feel like... Um, um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I took a lot, I, I took really painstaking level. I, I did painstaking levels of research, you know, like mm-hmm. just to try to like, I, I'm not a market research type of guy, but mm-hmm. I did want to make sure that I was fulfilling a need and not just my own personal desire to make this graphic novel. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't undoing the great work that JK Rowling had done <laughs> yeah. at Scholastic. Cause we were, we were in effect like living off of Harry Potter money. I mean, it was, it was Harry. If without Harry Potter, this is strangely enough, without Harry Potter, Amulet would not exist because Harry Potter's success allowed for David Saylor, the creative director who designed the Harry Potter books for Scholastic, mm-hmm. you know, to, um, to have to have the ability to go and make an imprint, and because he loved comics so much, he made it a comics imprint, and he created really? graphics. That's how it started. Yeah, and it was directly from the success of Harry Potter, and so, you know, and I, I just as a you know a responsible individual, I just didn't want to take yeah. kids away from yeah. literature. Yeah. You know, and at the time, I was like a little bit afraid of that because I think that people, when they think of comics and they see comics, there is that stigma yeah. oh, that the kids are going to become dumber or something, mm-hmm. you know, that the kids are going to be taken away from the books, mm-hmm. the, the real books, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I wanted to make sure that people knew that I was being very mindful to not allow that to happen, yeah. you know. And I wasn't sure how that would come into play until yeah. after Amulet 1 went out there. And then we got these emails and these letters, and we now get them like all the time. In fact, today we just got this long, yeah, we just got great, another fantastic email from somebody who was just saying, email, my yeah. my son is a you know is a third grader who has a very tough time reading, and he's it's been a struggle to get him to read something, yeah. but he can't put amulet down, you know, That's and so he cool. just he just finds a way to he wants to <laughs> keep reading the books, and so when we read that, I, I hear I see that, and I'm like, I obviously have found a need that we fulfill Mm -hmm. and that's that we are the people we're the gate we're the gatekeepers or the kind of the hosts Mm -hmm. at the at the door of the library and the bookstore yeah we're the ones who say you know what the water's warm come on in (laughs) you know and it was it was important that we found that audience and that we recognized that and then we like we kind of started nurturing it a little bit Mm -hmm. you know so we um we definitely played to that that audience you yeah know. i mean uh, unlike jeff jeff uh jeff smith uh, with bone mm-hmm. you know he, um jeff i will often say that he he did um he was just drawing for cartoon heads you know and uh, mm-hmm. people who just like the type of things that he liked what he does discount though is that he's an incredibly empathetic individual and that is essentially what you want to see in somebody who takes care of children that mm-hmm. he would be a great dad that's mm-hmm. what it comes down to he, he's a great parent and to me he's been a dad to me you know, like yeah, I see him and Scott McCloud as my dads. You know, mm-hmm. I really, I really see, look at them that way. You know, I respect and admire them in, this, in that way, um, and I think that the kids do too. You know, so um, even though he may not have assumed the role, you know, of being the parent, he is that type of person, and that shows in the work. Mm-hmm. And so the kids gravitated towards it. You know, and in our case, I felt like I kind of had to work into that role. I had to work to be like Jeff. You know, yeah. <laughs> like how do I be that guy? Because I'm not quite that guy, and I'm still like young, and I didn't have kids and stuff. You know, I just, just it wasn't it didn't come naturally to me at yeah. first, and I, I kind of ended up growing into it. Hmm. Um, but it was important, like Jason said, that you know, to recognize it and then and then try to bolster it. 
Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. and, and it ends up making my job easier. It makes makes the publisher's job easier, you know, and um, and makes parents' lives easier. I'm helping teachers, you know, helping mm-hmm. helping librarians, yeah. helping booksellers. You know, there's but not only that, it makes the work better. Yeah, and that like yeah. that's the really interesting thing. If you think about most creative work, you know, it works best as a conversation with somebody, as like you're you're speaking to an audience, you know. And once you recognize who that audience is and who it's for, it makes it easier for the work to kind of find itself, you know. It it just becomes better. Yeah. I mean, I think we live in a generation of kids who've kind of grown up on the the behind-the-scenes DVDs and things like that, you Mm -hmm. know. And so you hear often from artists, say, who like you admire, say, we just did it for ourselves, Mm -hmm. you know. But what they kind of, I think what's lost in translation there is that we did it for ourselves as audience members. I think yeah. that's really what they're saying. Like, yeah. this is, I'm an audience that needed this thing and I yeah, wanted exactly. this thing and, uh-huh. and no one was fulfilling that. Yeah. And now I'm making that thing yeah. for myself, the audience member, not for myself, the artist. And I think once we start thinking too much about ourselves as artists and trying to yeah. accommodate our artistic desires, yeah. then so we it's lose, less about, yeah, we lose that connection with our readers. It's less about what do I want to draw and more about like what would I have wanted to read, you know, at this mm-hmm. age, or what do I want to read right, right now, you know? Yeah. And, it, and how can I use my drawings to serve that purpose? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. Like that's why I decided to do my book is because in, it was like in 2006 at the Comic Con. I was just like, I, I, I just can't find the thing that I wish I could find here. You know? Yeah, and um, right. yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. It's just, yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I was like, I'm going to make that, you know? Yeah. And, and, uh, exactly. And it was, I think that was, I don't know. I think it was, re- it's really powerful when you try to just set out to do that. Otherwise you're right. just trying to imitate what other people are doing. Right. 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 Too, you know? Yeah. So, so with, um, with how things have changed in the last couple of years with, uh, mm-hmm. Scholastic, it's not a random house. It's Scholastic. It's Scholastic. Yeah. Amulet. Yeah. Okay. Um, are, are they, is it still positive and growing and are they still seeking for this kind of thing? Are they seeing the, the good in it? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they think of Amulet as a success. I hope yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we don't know. I don't know. You know, I always assume like everyone hates us or hates, <laughs> I always just assume everyone hates me. So I, I, I don't, <laughs> I mean, but I, I do sense that they're, they're trying to expand a bit, you know, um, they're always looking for, for good material. Yeah. But I like about the way Scholastic operates is that they've been very conservative in the things they choose. So that they could they can marshal the proper resources mm-hmm. when they need it for a project that they feel is worth uh, putting out there. Because mm-hmm. getting a book seen and read is is more than half the work. I mean, yeah. making it is one thing, yeah. but I th- I mean most of the work comes in trying to get people to read it. Mm-hmm. You know, and so just being good isn't good enough. You know, you mm-hmm. really have. I mean, I'm half the time I'm basically, you know. Well, operating the company to keep us alive, but I'm also traveling and promoting the books and mm-hmm. things like that. They can't, yeah. you know, you, you kind of have to have to do all that. So, and Scholastic does so much work on that front. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if they had too many books, they wouldn't be able to to do it right no, for a bunch of books. So, you know, mm-hmm. they they they're very picky and choosy, which I, I think is very we're very nice mm-hmm. about. You know, I, I like being with them for that reason. Yeah. Um, so they are looking for new material, but um, you know you have to have the proper medicine, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hopefully you gotta you know? have what they're you have. For. Yeah. Yeah. As, as, a, as a, there's that line in that, <laughs> in the yeah. assassination of Jesse James. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You gotta, you gotta have the ingredients. Yeah. <laughs> and so how would you, uh, from someone like that? <laughs> so, you don't have the ingredients. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, I love that. line. <laughs> so you gotta have the ingredients. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you how would you know what the ingredients are and how would you approach? Well, see, that, that, that's what I was talking to and talking about before. I actually, when I pitched the book, I um, um, I did a number of things, um, and it wasn't really I wasn't really you know I don't like pitching. <laughs> yeah. oh, <laughs> I'm just not a pitch guy, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I can do it pretty well. I used to you know pitch animated films and things like that, um, but I don't. I don't like having to pitch something. I like to just go ahead and do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so my attitude almost, and almost everything I do is here, I'm going to go do this anyway. And if you'd like to, if you'd like to partner up with me, 
you know, I'd be so happy yeah. to, you know, to see you there, you know? And, and that's kind of the way I approached a lot of the publishers. I just said, I'm going to make this book anyway. Cause I did yeah. Daisy on my own dollar. You know, I would, yeah. you know, if I had to work at a restaurant, you know, and, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then just uh, come in at nighttime and then just power through pages or do whatever it is I had to do to make that happen. Mm -hmm. I knew I would, I was capable of doing it cause I've done it before. Mm -hmm. So I saw the the same thing could happen with Amulet and I thought, okay, well this is something that was, something that's probably like a little bit easier to sell, you know? Um, but at the same time, I'm willing to just go and just do it on my own if I have to. Things like Kickstarter is fantastic now to see that, yeah. like, cause it gives the people the confidence that yeah. even if all else fails, there's an option for you, yeah. you know? But it's um, a great testing ground too. I mean, if it doesn't, mm -hmm. if you can't get any money for your project, then it probably means it's, you, you did something wrong. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Either your product isn't very good or, you know, you, you or ran a bad campaign. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, even my Kickstarter campaign was like that, like, you know, $2,000 is not going to pay for the printing of Daisy Cutter, yeah. but we made that our funding goal because we didn't care if we didn't get much money. We were going to do it. Yeah, We were going to do it anyway, yeah. but we just thought, Hey, you know, if you want, you could join us, yeah. you know, and that was sort of the way I, I approached Amulet too. Well, I also like to tell, like to tell a lot of artists that the people are buying your confidence and not your book, not just your book, but they're mm -hmm. buying your confidence, you know, yeah. and your competence, <laughs> yeah. but your, you know, your ability to, to execute mm -hmm. and your confidence in doing so, yeah. you know? And so you always have to find like not false confidence, but you have to have true confidence that you can deliver and you can make things happen yeah. and know that you have the ability to get that hap to happen. Yeah. And then once you have that lock in your head, then people kind of recognize that and yeah. they just sort of line themselves up with you. And so, man, that's hard to like have that, <laughs> to have that confidence in yourself, you know, but it's really important. You just earn it over time. Yeah. 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 It takes time. That's all. But that also comes with, you know, you said you did uh, daisy cutter yeah. on your own and then you started doing the, the flight and then, Right. It was through that. I mean, it yeah, was other it actually started with copper, and... really, because copper was like oh, the first time yeah. I was really completing stories, and I was doing it once a month. You know, yeah, like full stories on one page, and I... it was a really fantastic exercise. Yeah, so, I just, I just think it's that's an important thing for. I mean, even me to remember is, you know, you're in the situation because you did one thing after another and completed it, and then people started recognizing it, like. Yeah. Yeah. Three, four, five books <laughs> in, finally, uh -huh. you know. Well, I think that's, I'm I ten mean, years that's in now. Yeah, <laughs> People yeah. think I'm new. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's, no, I mean, it just takes time. But you know, uh -huh. if you can have this attitude where you would have done it anyway, yeah. You see what I mean? It goes right back into that. Like, mm -hmm. if I was, I would have done this anyway. Yeah. If, if I, if nobody paid me a dollar. Yeah. That's so, also the advice you give everyone mm -hmm. is just to do something. Just do something and finish it. Yeah. And just mm -hmm. keep keep doing it, and you know, don't. Don't worry about what people think about it. Just get it done and yeah. don't put worry it out about there. Whether it succeeds or not, yeah. you know, there's no reason to. You just work. In fact, you know, once you start succeeding, you'll realize that the success. Be like, if you're smart, you'll see that your success is now not necessarily an award. It's a responsibility hmm. that's been laid in your lap. You know, hmm. like basically, people just said you're good enough to do this and carry this torch. Now hmm. here, carry it. And if okay. you don't do that. The people are going to get really mad at you, <laughs> honestly, because you're going to be putting people out of work. Yeah. You're going to be making, you're going to be wasting people's time. They buy mm -hmm. your book, you know, so you have to be ready. And mm -hmm. if you're not ready and you don't have the ingredients, mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> then, you know, you can, you can really muck it up. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a fantastic place to be, to not have success. I think it's mm -hmm. a really great and fresh and, and there's like the sense of, hope and high prospects and fantastic like anything could happen at that point you know yeah. and so long as your expectations are realistic yeah and and you don't tr you truly don't expect anything back in return yeah then you are doing something out of unconditional love and i and 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 just to kind of to screw with people's minds in a way that is the recipe for success yeah. you know i i think that that you'll get it yeah if you really truly that will be the test and hmm. they'll see it in the work and they'll mm -hmm. like go, oh, this person would have done this anyway. Yeah. I want to follow this person along this road. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's interesting. And it, well, what that makes, it makes me wonder, like, because I asked you, how did you approach uh, Scholastic with Amulet? Mm -hmm. And it seems like 
you weren't even considering you, you, you weren't even considering them. And so for your next books, because you just you were like, I'm going to do this anyway because this is what I feel like I need. Right, to do. right. I mean, and, I would have done it with whatever publisher, but I knew Scholastic would be the right home in the yeah. end. Yeah, but it wasn't. I but, didn't. I didn't make the book. For, so for them, and it was and already their guidelines. Yeah, right? it was already several years old. It was just sitting. Yeah. You know, I have, you know, like when I and I hear people go, "Oh man, I've got all these great ideas." I go, mm-hmm. "Well, get in line, man, because we all do." Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'm yeah. serious. Like, I it's actually just, not. It's almost a curse. Yeah, you know, I like having all these different ideas. Yeah. You know, because sometimes it'd be good to just have one great idea, <laughs> and then you know, because it'll make yeah. things a lot easier. Because then you yeah. can just market yourself that way, brand it around that one great idea, mm-hmm. and then. Mm-hmm. And it's like freeing, you know, yeah. it, like when you can just focus on one thing. It's mm-hmm. actually one of my biggest bad habits is that I have like this want to do all sorts of crazy ideas. You yeah. Know? And I have to, I, I keep having to chop down those trees. Yeah. Well, I keep wanting, I, I guess I keep wanting go, to go back to this because I, um, I'm thinking like, all my questions are are for me. I'm not thinking about the audience at no, all. Yeah, I'm no, completely no. selfish here. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. like it's fine. <laughs> um, with like Scholastic and stuff. I've thought, okay, I should maybe I should do this story next because this will cater to them. But what you're saying is do what I want to do, whether Scholastic would like it exactly, or not. Exactly. And if yeah. it fits with them, good. If it fits with another company, good. If I need to self publish it, good. Yeah, right? I mean, well, otherwise it's not well, true. Is, it's I, not something I love. Right, but. Uh, well, it's 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 tricky because when I put together Amulet, I do think about that audience, yeah. But I don't think about Scholastic, yeah, so much. You know, you know, they just want me to think about the audience. You know, they're mm-hmm. hiring me to like take care of the kids. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean? To to and that to some extent. And as know? long as you fulfill that goal, they're happy. Yeah, I just have to make sure that, you know, yeah. that that part is... I know that as part of my relationship with them, I have to do that, you know? And it makes their lives a little bit easier and mine too, yeah. you know, if I if I accommodate in that regard. Um, but when I was putting together Amulet, I did not think nece- that it was necessarily for kids. Mm. I mean, I had the scenes in my head, like the car accident at the very beginning. I thought that was like a little too hairy for kids, you know? Yeah. It begins with a death, you know? And there's yeah. blood and there's there's a death. It's like a, yeah. a car accident. It's like, it's it's super, you know, it's traumatic and violent. And yeah. and I, I just, I thought as a kid, I would want to see that actually. Yeah. You know, um, honestly, I mean, I, I watched Robocop at eight, you know, and <laughs> Aliens around that time too. Mm-hmm. And. Yeah. And they had a profound impact on me. I, yeah. I was trying to watch those movies, really. Mm-hmm. I, so um, I don't think um, I think kids really do want some some heavy heavy stuff. But also, I did remember that at the age of five, I really was preoccupied with the idea that my parents could die at any moment, and it was mm-hmm. really hard for me to deal with that. And I would go to sleep at night crying. I remember that mm-hmm. like a lot, many, many, many times. Uh, mm-hmm. My parents didn't know this, but I would just cry in my bed because <laughs> I would just mm-hmm. think my mom's gonna die. My grandma's going to die. My dad's going to die. And, and at the time, I thought I was alone. But then I realized, you know, that's just probably is human nature. That's, that's something about our human nature. It's, it's our survival mode as our parents at that point. They are everything to us. So, you know, just like you might be afraid of losing your job the next day, you're afraid of losing your parents, you know? Yeah. And so, you, you know, to be fully honest with those kids, I, I felt like, hey, you know, I would like to basically go in there and say, Hey, I thought about those things too. Yeah. So then they, they think of me uh, as an equal in a way. And then yeah. we're now we're in the discussion, you know, like yeah. in, on an even plane yeah. and then, and then we can go on these fun adventures and things like that, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and we have their attention. Um, uh, if, if there's a secret to amulet success, I think it's that there's like, I do as much as I can to understand my 10 year old self mm. or my five year old self. You know, mm-hmm. I, I really think about what I used to be like. And I was telling somebody the other day that, you know, the big thing about Amulet is, is it's like a, a letter that I send. It's like a care package I send to my 10-year-old self okay. that says, here are the things you might want to think about. It's coming up. You may want to, to really think about these things just because it may help you. And here are some robots and some ro- and monsters <laughs> and cool cool stuff along the way. You know, here's some extra. Th- that's part of the care package. You put the candies in with the medicine, right? Yeah. So um, that's kind of the way I, I think of Amulet, you know. Again, going back to that idea that to think of your, 
doing something for yourself as an audience member and not as an artist. Yeah. You know? And and when I was when I was that age, I was not yet an artist. I didn't realize that I had the capability at any point in my life that I'd be able to do something like this. Yeah. It was just magic to me that somebody would make something like this. So I have to remember that that's the way that that's the way we're going to interface with our audience. Yeah. It's magic to them. So wow. I, I kind of just erased myself behind the scenes. You know, yeah. I'm behind the curtain on on Amulet for the most part. The characters, you know, are the book, not yeah. me. Yeah. Interesting. So Jason, you, you you color all the pages. You're the, yeah. the lead color writer, and, yeah. And because you, you yeah, it's write more involved. It, it's um, yeah, I um, and draw I write characters. and I, I draw I draw all the panels and you know mm-hmm. do the layouts and stuff. And um, um, we have a bunch of assistants that actually flat the pages, prepare the pages for painting. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jason gets them. They're indispensable. Yeah, and, couldn't couldn't do it without them. Yeah, we have a pretty big team that comes in for, you know, <clears throat> our amulet season as we call it. Okay. And they come in and help us with the books and yeah, they're they're fantastic. And yeah. uh Jason uh manages all that, like the mm-hmm. production of it, you know, um more and more. When he first started he was just painting a few pages. Mm-hmm. Now he paints almost all the pages. Um uh I basically just he kind of reads my mind now. Mm-hmm. So he's he's not just a painter, but he's like an art director. You know, I sort of just, you know, treat my job as, like, I'm a director. Yeah. Well, I mean, for, like, in terms of what what I have to do for color, um, not only am I coloring, but I'm also, like, creating the backgrounds for many of the panels because Kazoo just doesn't draw it in just to, like, keep the speed up and just focus on character and story and yeah. all of that. So uh, a lot of the time... Um, I have to like create backgrounds for pages or, you know, we'll have entire spreads that, you know, I kind of have to create out of thin air. That's mostly just world building stuff mm-hmm. and, um, stuff that I just absolutely love to do. And cause he doesn't really have time for anymore as much as he loves to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I absolutely, that's the thing. I love doing it yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, and Jason knows it. So I, yeah. have to, I basically get kicked out of that room <laughs> to yeah. focus on the story stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a really, um, it's a really fun job. You know, I, I kind of feel like Kazoo, while we're working, I always think of it as, like, Kazoo is working for the first read, you know, for, like, the the readers, like, first time through the book. You know, they're just getting the characters, the dialogue, they're reading the story. And I think of myself as working for the second read. So when kids finish it and they immediately flip back to page one and they're like, oh, what was that in the background of that panel? Yeah. Or, oh, look at that guy back there, you know? Like, that kind of stuff is what I work for. It's kind of like enriching the space and the world and um, making sure that the book lives in kids' minds outside of the pages, you know, that they're like, they continue thinking about it and that it, it feels like a place that they can go to. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So it's, a, it's an awesome job. Yeah. I never, I never thought when I was working on all my older comics, I never thought of the color as, um, something that's just color, just adding color to something. You know, mm-hmm. I always thought about it as like an extra layer of storytelling. Mm. And in order to tell a good story, it takes time to do it. You know, and I wanted to make sure that everything wasn't rushed. I was when you look at Amulet One, I had to indicate so much because of my production. Like I had mm-hmm. a, I had to do you know four or five different things per page, you know, yeah. <laughs> including hand lettering that book actually, oh, you wow. know, all the way through. And, uh, and I just, I had to make sure that I had left enough time for me to be able to do all those things and then scrap it and then scrap it all and then do it again. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now, um, having Jason here allows me to put more focus on the writing. And so I think the writing of the books gets better yeah. and, and it's not necessarily because I'm getting better. I think it's just cause I get more time on it because before mm-hmm. There was no time. I mean, I'm having to draw so fast, yeah. you know, and it makes me sad because, like, I think people think that I have an enormous <laughs> amount of time to do these things. Yeah, and, we, and we, we don't, don't have very much. You know? yeah. and we do a book in about <laughs> seven months. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Every year. <laughs> and from, like, that's from sketches to final. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and, like, and when, when you're writing that, are you kind of making a lot I of just have to, go? Yeah, it is, like, literally mm-hmm. like having a... Or no, it's not literally, but figuratively. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, figuratively, it's uh, like it's statement. metaphorically. Uh, it, it is. It's totally like um, laying track for a, a steam locomotive that just heads barreling down the track. Wow. It's the deadline. Do you, yeah. do you ever get 
stuck down the road since you just have to force yourself to get unstuck. So, okay. <laughs> so your approach yeah, I do to get writing, stuck. I, did, I get stuck. Is yeah. your approach yeah. then like like you know the characters, you let them tell the story? Sometimes you kind of just it's, it's subtly guide it's, it, it. It's not always like that. Okay, um, there is a plan, but it's loose. I try to keep it loose so that everyone. I, I, I sort of just see it as like a bunch of different rooms, maybe about twelve rooms, twelve spaces. Okay, you know, and each individual space is like its own story. Like each scene, mm-hmm. there's like twelve to fourteen scenes per book, and um, each one is its own story. Mm-hmm. And that's actually how I handled the whole thing. Is I basically self serialized the book. Because if I tried to write and draw and think about every little part of the book all the way through, um, my brain would explode. I've already tried. I've already tried to do that, and I can only get up to about a hundred pages until my brain is just so wired okay. and so like fried yeah. that I just hate working on it. You know, and I can't stand it. Huh. So what I do now is I force myself to look away from certain scenes. Mm-hmm. So if I get stuck at something, I will actually just move to a whole another sequence that might um, be something I can unlock. Mm-hmm. You know, I look at this scene and go, you know what, I think, I, I think I've got the ingredients, <laughs> yeah. uh, so to speak, huh. uh, for that particular scene, Yeah, more so than I, I, I do for this particular scene, so I'll just move over. So the book actually comes together really organically now. Mm-hmm. And for the last two books, the like the very one of the very first scenes in the book is always like one of the last that Kazoo works on. He just kind of like skips through, you know, works on like the beginning for a little while and then later on and then that'll unlock some ideas that he can take back a couple right. of scenes and Okay. Yeah. So just um, making sure the book, beginning and the end yeah. kind of tie together. Sort of. It, it it gets even more complex than that. In the fifth book it was really challenging because yeah. I wanted there to be a massive change of pace. Mm. I wanted somebody to be able to read this book and then I wanted it to feel that there's a point in the book and I think you'll know it when you read it. Mm-hmm where it just moves from like all of a sudden you're going you're in high gear and then it just like slows back <laughs> to a crawl and it's and there's a purpose to it mm-hmm. because it's like basically telling everybody in this, mo- this world you need to just think back on your history right now like this is really important that you really just slow it down mm-hmm. and when you write you kind of have to be physically and mentally in that same headspace so you can't really go from super fast to super slow on the same like pace deadline. So mm-hmm. what was really complicated about five, and it's hard to talk about it without actually spoiling too much of the book, but mm-hmm. um, I actually wrote the slow scene in small chunks over a long period of time. And this was actually mm-hmm. weird. It was interesting for me because as a writer, I felt really, it was very deliberate. Um, I was actually trying to make it really slow and I was trying to discover a lot about that scene. In, in tiny, tiny little chunks. And so when you read it, even though the words, there's n- there's the same amount of words as a fast scene, mm-hmm. or the same amount of panels as a fast scene, it doesn't feel fast, it feels very slow. Mm-hmm. Because that's where I was in terms of my head headspace. I forced myself in that headspace yeah. by not working on, by working <clears throat> on that scene early on. And there are even, there are early drafts of it that do have like a sense of urgency going from, you know, um, place to place in that scene but you know like those pages got scrapped and then it just slowed down a little more and so it's, it was really interesting to see it's, it's kind of like kneading bread yeah <laughs> seeing that scene in particular come together over the course yeah. of the production was really interesting yeah it was really fun for me as a writer because I, I never had the time to be able to do stuff like that having jason yeah. here freed me up yeah. to know that it'll look good in the end so yeah. i could just just knead the bread you know so to speak yeah <laughs> it was crazy but it was less stressful than four, wasn't it? Over no, one. no, <laughs> equal, equal. Yeah, yeah, not more, but equal. Yeah, it was but, interesting because we we actually worked um, fewer hours. Yeah, I think on that's book what, yeah. five. There you go. Yeah, yeah, it was it was stressful. Yeah, but we we still took weekends off. You know, we were still in here for. I mean, it was getting to maybe like 10 to 12 hour days, but not all that bad. Those are the hard days. Those are the hard days. Yeah, yeah. but most of the time it was like five to seven hours a day. You know? Yeah. It was a regular job, really. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. we, we made it a goal to live normal lives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just said like, we gotta, we gotta make that part of this, you yeah. know, or else it's, or else we're failing. 
Yeah. You know? And so we, so we took our weekends out of the equation mm-hmm. and just mm-hmm. forced ourselves to go home and, you know, just be yeah. with the family. And it was great for our sanity because then by the time you come back on Monday, you really want, you're geared to work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and if you really needed the weekends, you got them. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, they they can bail you out. And we did. And we, yeah, we, for that last, maybe for like a last Saturday or so. Weeks, yeah. yeah. We would do Saturdays. And That's cool. Yeah. No all nighters though. First time. Yeah. No all nighters. First ever. time on Amulet that we didn't pull yeah. an all nighter. So yeah. was, that was a milestone. That was fantastic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. Yeah. We were up late once. But I don't think we even could. It was a very, very I don't think we could pull an all-nighter on that book. Like we were both. Yeah, we were both pretty fried. But the thing is, we we basically managed um, the crunch because mm-hmm. we saw it coming about three or four months out. I just told Jason, "Look, it's coming," mm-hmm. because we are now so far behind. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, we would have to do. We 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 literally had to do twice as much work. Yeah, as number four in the same amount of time, mm-hmm. and, and we're like, how good? How much better have we gotten? That was yeah. the thing. How good are we? How good are we? <laughs> how good are we at that? How good are we right now? Um, I know we're better. I know we're faster. Yeah, I know we're more confident. But are we this confident? Can we do it t- double speed? <laughs> and we like thought, well, if we just let's just do the math. And I actually set up a spreadsheet for us, and there was an equation. They gave us like the exact amount of work we had to do every single day on a on a network day, which means it's on any of the weekdays. Okay. And and if we missed that mark on a day, then that number goes up incrementally. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so we had a counter and we can watch it. Mm-hmm. And so it's like a game. So, so every day you type. Yeah, in we were just you yeah we just like we just tell we just tell the spreadsheet how what we got done. And it'll tell us how much yeah. we need to do tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And that way you don't have to worry about 10 days out. You don't have to worry yeah. about 15 days out. You know what I mean? You don't have to worry mm-hmm. about what happens at the end. You just have to worry about what happens tomorrow. Yeah. And when you bring it down to that level, it's stressful, but it's manageable because yeah. it's easy to see. And I, I think that was really, really important. It was a great lesson that we learned on that, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. in terms of our managing the amount of work that we have to do. Okay. Yeah. But it's one of the hardest things to do as a comic artist is to have that self-discipline to manage your time. You know, when you're when you're skipping around from writing to drawing to inking to all of that stuff, and you know, the like, mm-hmm. all you can think is, I just, I need more time. I need more time on this. <laughs> yeah. You know, and you're not thinking about like, but I have to ink it. You know, and I have to, and then I have to paint it, and I like I, all that factors into the amount of time. Um, when you just have that sense of immediacy, it's hard to get a sense of like the entire project and like how much time you actually need to get this thing done. Mm-hmm. So, and wow. so a lot of times, I mean, speed. I mean, speed is just is the key. You know, yeah. that's what Doug. Yeah, I was just thinking the same thing. That's Doug's what Doug like fantastic. You know, <laughs> so fast that guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I had to teach myself to draw super fast. I had to finish, force myself to finish pages that I couldn't finish. Mm-hmm. And by that I mean there are pages in Amulet where we just go without dialogue. I just go with by feel. I go like, okay, well, this something like this happens in this scene, mm-hmm. so I'll just do four pages of this stuff, and I'll just make it look like they're talking to each other. Mm-hmm. And at some point, and I paint it. And, yep. And then it's <laughs> the, like the last thing we do. We'll add dialogue to it. Yeah. Uh, I, there, I mean, there are, there are like four or five page sequences. That Most are people like that. will never know which ones they are. Actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oftentimes, they're actually some of the best. Yeah, and that, I yeah. mean, it's really interesting because in book three... The Marvel way, I guess. Yeah, Marvel book way, three... Yeah. <laughs> book three and That's book five, <laughs> two, of, two of those scenes are... They, they end up being kind of the crux of the book mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. It's really, really interesting. Yeah, for the most part, though, I know what the dialogue is going to be like. I actually play act the scenes. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I literally play act the scenes. I, I do, like, just run through it like it's a play. Oh, really? You know, yeah. And um, I'll rehearse it before mm-hmm. doing the scenes. So, Do you record yourself then? No, 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 no. It's just, it just memory, you know? Yeah. Like, it's like doing the scene over several times and then going, you know, that's going to work. And Because when I draw, mm-hmm. I feel like it's a performance. It, you yeah. know, that's what it feels like when I draw. I, like, have to really... The best scenes are the ones where I'm like, you know, Jason can tell I'm, like, going... I'm, like, basically there, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and, I, and I'm just not even thinking about the drawings anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and in order to do that, I have to know exactly what's going to, for the most part, I have to know exactly what's going to happen, time it correctly, yeah. and then know all the subtext that I have to hit, yeah. and then rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it, and then just say, okay, you know what, I've got all the parts, 
I've got all the ingredients. Uh, we're going to go back to the word ingredients. Ingredients for the stew. Yeah. Because I feel like I'm about to prepare a stew to, you know, for somebody. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I take a look at all the sketches I did, the little script notes and everything like that, you know, all the dialogue notes that I made. I go, okay, I think I'm ready to do this scene now. And mm-hmm. then I do the scene. And usually, like, you can just do it in a couple of days. But for those couple of days of actually drawing those pages, um, you know, it, many, many hours have gone into thinking about it, you know. Yeah. I'm often just working. Like, I don't even look like I'm working. People uh, don't realize that I'm usually, I need to do something else to think about the scenes properly. Yeah. I'll I'll go and wash dishes. I'll go play basketball and break my hand. (laughs) (laughs) You know, for your audience. Your your right hand, right? Yeah, it was, yeah. (laughs) Uh, uh, We dodged a bullet on that one. Uh, I broke my left hand. Yeah, because um, he has a cast right now. Just so you yeah, know. yeah, broke my hand. <laughs> I told you too. That was the you're yeah. Lucky was, it's I'm the, allowed to, it's the I'm hand allowed you're allowed to break, to break. this one. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, it's not going to stop me from playing basketball, but um, <laughs> maybe for a little while. But um, yeah, I tried. To, I, I basically just clean the office and do other things. You know, <clears throat> a lot of times that's when I get the best ideas. I just keep running the scenes through in my head yeah. and go, "What did I do?" And it's always a, it's like a puzzle. You know, mm-hmm. I'm constantly doing mental gymnastics. To see like if I can get a better result, okay. you know, yeah. not necessarily if I to solve it because it can be solved pretty quickly, but it could just be a generic scene. Yeah. And now that I have the ability to spend more time writing the stories, I just keep flipping the story over in my brain to see if there are more angles to it, you know, mm-hmm. different things about it. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting for me to like see the pages come in, and I can I can always tell if it's a scene where because it was just there. It was really easy, and he just got it, and he just, like, put it down. And, you know, it was, like, nothing. You yeah, and, it, and your paintings become better. And then it's the easiest thing in the world for me to paint when I see that because I understand it immediately. I'm like, okay, this is what he's going for. All right, and I can I can help, you know, um, foster that a little bit and, you know, boost it. Um, but then there are those scenes where I can tell he's just, like, pulling his hair out, trying to finish it, like, trying to figure out what it's about right up until the end and then he kind of like scrapes by and gets it but not quite so i know it's one of those scenes he's going to go back to and when i'm reading it i just can't for whatever reason i just can't get a sense of it and those are the hardest for me to take to final and you know there were a couple little sequences like that in book five where it was just so hard because i knew he was still like close like almost there like kind of had it figured out um but then I knew it was something that he was going to come back and change. And then we'll go back and repaint those. Mm-hmm. We repaint okay. a lot of pages, yeah. 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 But interesting. Well, but, but once we do that, like we change things and make things better. I mean, yeah. it does get better. Yeah. And those pages become the best pages, the mm-hmm. ones that have been like. It's like it's like creating new culture. You know, you built a building out of stucco, and yeah. then you 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 tore it down. You tore down the mini mall and replaced it with a nice building. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. That's kind of how it feels like. You, yeah. You're, <clears throat> Though I also feel like the best, uh, some of the best pages in the book are just the ones where it was clear yeah, from kinda, start to finish. You know, yeah, yeah. where you're just like, "Yep, that's the scene." You put it down, and then it goes to me, and I'm like, "Yep, that's the scene." <laughs> and we paint I it. Wish and it, it was feels, like that. yeah, and it feels <laughs> yeah. really, it feels really right. fluid and organic. And I feel like we get to that point um, through those pages that we end up painting over and over and over again. We get to that point at the halfway point. Yeah. That's when the pages start coming in. Because at that point, it's about solving problems. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When it's about solving problems and not creating the problems, it's <clears> not <throat> as bad. It's mm-hmm. easy to solve a problem. It's very difficult to create the right problem to solve, <laughs> mm-hmm. if, if that makes mm-hmm. any sense. I mean, as a storyteller, you are creating problems Yeah. to begin. And that's why it's so difficult yeah. to look at a blank, blank canvas, you know. Um, and, that, and then having the... In hindsight, you can take a look at what you did wrong or right. Yeah. You know, and then try yeah. to do better because you know you always have an opinion of how to make a movie better. Yeah, or yeah. something. You know, you look at somebody else's work and go, "Oh, they, they should have done this." Yeah, you know. Yeah, and now you can mine, apply it to your own work. Yeah, a friend of mine and I were just talking about this today about how a lot of people say, you know, start out with story structure, but I, I feel like story structure is is all in hindsight. It's it's yeah. You, it you is, can you can break apart every is, movie. Yeah. And put it into a structure, mm-hmm. but, Man. but uh, I, mean, that, I mean that's the that's the nice stuff to have in your head. Yeah. But at the end of the day, when you're when you're in there, it's really tough. Yeah. You know, yeah. and honestly, people are really in, just into 
experiencing something, yeah. you know, and it doesn't always have to be a structured story, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and often yeah. I, I kind of hope that we're kind of getting into a phase now of just making stories that feel like they just live and breathe a bit more yeah. because I don't think we, I see enough of that in, yeah. in modern like cinema right now. You know, I just yeah. feel like everyone's a film student yeah. Yeah. and everyone's I've, trying to, I've seen formula. movies. Yeah. I, I do that too. I, I'm guilty, you know, yeah. as charged, I'm still not completely good enough to just float like a, like Miyazaki does that. Right. I mean, yeah. you just look at his movies and you go like, what was he thinking here? Yeah. But I like it. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I like that's the really yeah. that's the really interesting thing exactly. because I've seen movies recently that hold like uh, that like really try and stick to that idea of story and story structure and they're mm -hmm. like trying to engineer this this behemoth you know and it just completely falters as a mm -hmm. result of that. Um, whereas you know I love movies like like Miyazaki's movies where it yeah. feels organic and it feels like he just wanted to create a nice space for you yeah. to go to and to right. experience. And yeah. it was like a Jim Jones um, film. And I, I mean, I just read an article recently about how the three act structure is a myth, which I yeah. think is a really interesting thing. Um, cool. it, it's a good uh, guideline, you know, yeah. I think having those structures is okay to have, but mm -hmm. then when you're actually working on the story, it's often best to just toss it. Yeah, you know, unless you, you really use it if help. you need help. Yeah, it's like yeah, um, it's, your, it's like learning it's perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you learn perspective, and I, I remember in school learning perspective and trying to grid everything out. And for me, it was just like trying to keep track of all those rules in my brain while I was trying to create something that felt real and like nice to look at and organic. It just didn't it didn't work for me. Like every time, it would just feel rigid and forced and. Yeah. Um, and what I realized was I should just, while I'm drawing, just forget the rules. Just forget them. Like, don't worry about it at all. And then when I get to a point where I'm stuck or something doesn't look quite right yeah. or something's not working, then I bring them back. Yeah. You know, and I feel like story is kind of the same thing. You just forget the rules. Just worry about, you know, a couple basic things. Worry about getting an idea down on paper. And when you look at it and you see problems with it, then you bring the rules in and you're like, mm -hmm. okay, well, why is this an issue? Oh, I understand. And then you can move forward. Yeah. So it, it becomes a tool for solving problems instead of like a guideline that you lay out and you, you know, like a framework that you lay out and you just place everything. Yeah. You know, yeah. so. Incredible. There you go. That's part one of the conversation. Uh, as soon as I can get a little more time to do some more editing, I'll shoot out part two. Until next time, see ya. Hey guys, thanks for listening. This is Jason Brubaker. I just wanted to invite you to go to Coffee Table Comics, sign up for my mailing list, and you'll get a free copy of Remind the Graphic Novel, Volume 1, for free as a PDF. And then I'll uh, also let you know whenever I have a new Kickstarter. And share this YouTube channel with all your friends who like comics. Thanks, guys. Bye.